West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Let's dive right into the breaking news and a potentially groundbreaking shift in American constitutional law. The Supreme Court appears poised to strike down the landmark Roe v. Wade decision. According to a leaked draft opinion published last night by Politico, a majority of the Supreme Court is prepared to overturn the right to abortion. The leak of the 98-page document is unprecedented in the court's modern history. The draft opinion was reportedly authored by Justice Samuel Alito and circulated in February. Alito writes in part this, Roe was egregiously wrong from the start. Its reasoning was exceptionally weak and the decision has had damaging consequences. It is time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives. NBC News has not obtained or been able to independently verify the authenticity of the document, and the Supreme Court has declined to comment. The final opinion is expected in late June or early July. Joe, so many different moving parts here, but overall, what does this story mean for the Supreme Court? Well. I mean, for the Supreme Court, in a word, illegitimacy. You know, the court's always been guided by the law, but it's also been keenly aware that as the only unelected branch of American government, they needed to not appear to be openly contemptuous of public opinion. That would be especially true today, given the GOP's might makes right approach to the sacking of Merrick Garland's nomination or the elevation of Donald Trump's final pick. One more thing. Look at this picture, Mika, from Madeleine Albright's funeral. Mm. The five Democratic politicians on the front row won the most votes in the presidential elections of 1992, 1996, 2000, 2008, 2012, 2016, and 2020. And yet, a half century of constitutional rights supported by over 70% of Americans. Let me underline that again, because people lying to you uh, on other channels will never say this. Uh, over 70% of Americans support that constitutional right. It'll be swept away by the presidents not in this picture, and the presidents who were outvoted in each one of those elections over the last three decades. Now, Americans will rightly conclude that their voices and their votes no longer matter. So what are the implications for the court, for the law, and for American democracy? Let's bring in historian John Meacham and also former acting U.S. Solicitor General Neil Cottiel. John, let me begin with you. And uh, as uh, Kissinger uh, said, I think during Vietnam, uh, perception is reality. Obviously, the perception for 70 percent of Americans uh, waking up this morning uh, is is going to be uh, uh, most likely that that this is an illegitimate decision by an illegitimate court. 
Well, the crisis of trust in institutions has just become universal uh, in a way that uh, is pretty much the nightmare scenario. Uh, if you believe in the ultimate efficacy of the constitutional order to produce a more perfect union, right? to protect uh, the Jeffersonian uh, assertion of equality, to protect the rule of law for all of its imperfections. The system has been worth defending uh, for 250 years. Right now, if this draft decision, if the court were to go this far, uh, you will have, as you were just saying, an extraordinary number of Americans uh, believing that the system, in fact, cannot, is not capable of delivering justice, is not capable of reflecting the popular will, even through the constitutional prism. And I think that, you know, one of the great questions of the era, the great question of the era, is are you and I, are we in this decade, are we up to democracy? Are we commensurate to the task? And I, I'm worried that we're entering the darkest period of that test, because if you have any reservations about the system's capacity to deliver justice, they have just been affirmed. Neil Katyal, uh, again, this isn't actually terribly surprising based on the oral arguments we heard in the Dobbs case back in December. But as Joe points out, poll after poll shows this is about a 30 percent position that the Supreme Court has taken. It doesn't obviously operate on polls. It operates on whether or not they believe this Roe versus Wade should be upheld, whether it's legal. But you've slept on this. You've read through uh, most of the opinion or the draft opinion. What is your first blush reaction, first to the sub? of it and second to this leak uh, honestly I want to cry um, you know I want to cry in so many different ways but um, but just to start with the substance of this decision this is as full-throated and a um, uh, muscular a decision as could ever be envisioned. And yes, after the oral argument, I think we all predicted Roe versus Wade was on thin ice. I think many thought it would be another year. Um, I mean, for the last three years, I've been saying, given once Justice Barrett got on the court, Roe's days are numbered. But to see it in mm -hmm. print, um, obviously, it's only a draft opinion, uh, but it sure looks like a real opinion. I mean, this is hard. This is not it doesn't look like it's a deep fake or anything like that. He uses all of Justice Alito's kind of signature moves. Um, and uh, so it really does feel legitimate. And what it means just on abortion first is that states can now pass laws with no rape or incest exception whatsoever prohibiting abortion. And those are now constitutional. The Supreme Court will not stand in their way. Congress can pass such a law outlawing abortion in the 50 states. The Supreme Court will not stand in its way. So that's on abortion. And then the reasoning of this decision is so, as I say, muscular, it could, attack, it could reach other rights as well, including the right of marriage equality, which is just recognized by the Supreme Court a few years ago. I mean, this is an opinion that Robert Bork would have written. This is not an opinion that most justices who have lived in our lifetimes would have written. And Robert Bork, of course, was rejected for the court because of these views. It is Tuesday, the 3rd of May of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, a small scant dash, a mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. And boy, it better on this Tuesday. It's not every Tuesday you wake up knowing that, hey, your constitutional rights are not only eroding, they're being stripped from the very core of what it is to be America. Yeah. Thanks, Alito. <laughs> yeah. God, he's a ghoul. He's also a religious tyrant. And there is no room for religious tyrants in any part of our body politic. Anywhere. We need to purge these Christo-fascist religious tyrants 
first off the courts, because it seems to me like they're fairly well embedded throughout the whole system and have been stacked by the Federalist Society and also the Heritage Foundation. Let's not forget them for five decades or more. I'm getting tired of it. And then they say, oh, well, you know, we can't have the American Bar Association judge uh, whether uh, a jurist is qualified. <laughs> the only qualification that the Federalist Society needs is if they're, well, telegenic. <laughs> Actually, how that works with Heritage and Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society. The telegenic one sometimes might run for office or get slotted into some cable news show. But in this case, it's to stack the courts with a bunch of Christo fascists. And out of that Christo fascism comes a lot of other fascist types of behaviors. And here we are. We thought we could just shake hands and get along. No, <laughs> I've been telling everybody we need to punch the Nazis. This is what happens when you don't punch the Nazis. I know, you think the rhetoric is vile and violent? Well, I, I, I don't care. <laughs> because you punch the Nazi in any way you can. You punch him in the wallet, you punch him in the legislation, and my God... We need to purge these Nazis from our government, if not our whole society. No room for Nazis. <sighs> One of the first things that um, Hitler did, the Nazis did, when in their, I got to tell you, it wasn't a short march. It was a fairly long march to take over the German government. And one of the things they did was to delegitimize the courts and then make them wholly over into Nazi courts. And that's how you got a people's court. One of the first things that Putin did in his, well, relatively short march to being dictator was to delegitimize the Russian courts, uh, albeit they were new as they were just venturing into a representative democracy, but... You can't have the rule of law when you are the law, okay? Well, let's put it this way. You can't have a court judge a rule of law when you are the law if that court doesn't, uh, you know, give legitimacy to your rule of law above all others, even the capital L, law. So the Republican Party and their handlers for decades and decades and decades and decades of worked tirelessly and ceaselessly to delegitimize our courts, and now look what is happening. You have a guy like Alito drafting this opinion that pretty much, you know, there's no historical uh, legitimacy to women having any equality. He even cites... English law, which I got to tell you, you know, when you study constitutional history, there's always European law in there, too. OK, that's where we came from. Let's not deny it. But I love how he uh, cites a famed jurist from England who himself was known to have executed at least at least two women as witches. And then he drafts a, a treatise himself in which he defends marital rape. And this is the fellow that Alito is citing as evidence. Well, really, you know, this concern about women having privacy or anybody having privacy is not. There's no historical perspective on that. Give me a break, Sam. I, you know, I, I just keep thinking maybe maybe if George Washington was around, he'd cane these idiots. Wouldn't that be nice? Jeez. But I got to tell you, if Washington was around these days, he'd be a commie Antifa socialist, wouldn't he? Okay. 
It says right in the Constitution, you know, Alito keeps saying, oh, there's none of this stuff. There's nothing in there about abortion in the, in the Constitution. Nothing in there about uh, right to privacy. Well, there's a lot of shit that you guys do that's not in the Constitution either. And you know what? There's nothing about quantum mechanics in the Constitution. There's nothing about, uh, uh, I don't know, international law and space in the Constitution. They want to take us back to where it was only white male landowners that could vote. That's what Alito is looking at. That's what he's talking about as the grand old times. And then from that, it follows that the landed gentry have the right, if not the God-given duty, to enslave the peoples around them to work the land. The landed gentry are the embodiment of God on earth. And by God, you better take heed. Okay. So I guess that puts us on a track to, I don't know, be the outliers in in the world. Maybe we could align with Russia and have our go back to our, our great glory days. You know, the serfs on the steps. And we could just have, like, you know, the slaves on the plantation back again. Thank you. I always thought it was suspect when an economic engine could only survive and work <laughs> when it had slaves doing the labor. All right. I'm just, this is what happens when you compromise with the proto-Nazis. Because these slave owners who forced the United States to concede to their point of view brings us to where we are now. And when you look at a map of those states that have already got the so-called trigger laws in place, so as soon as Alito comes out with that draft opinion as being the opinion, immediately abortion is illegal in those states. And what do those states look like? My God, they look like those of the declared war against the United States in the 1860s. This whole fight about abortion. And we have to remember, the only reason they started coming up about abortion was because of school desegregation. This began as a fight against school desegregation. Also, when they say, oh, there's never been anything like this before. The Supreme Court's never leaked. Well, you know what? Roe v. Wade was leaked before Berger issued the opinion. All right? Give me a break. Now, albeit this one seems a lot more strategic politically. And there's a lot of speculation about who and what faction may have leaked it. Could have been the conservatives floating it out, floating it out there to, to sort of, well... Dull the senses, you know, get people used to the idea. Some think, it, think that it may have come from the liberal faction just to show the world, like, what the hell is going on here? Or it was leaked to get Roberts in line. And I don't mean Roberts in line and being against it, though his vote doesn't matter now anymore, does it? We still have to get a Gorsuch, a Thomas, a Barrett, or a Kavanaugh to agree that Roe v. Wade should stay in place. And that is not going to happen. They pack the courts, and those jurists who are now about to decide the future of... They keep saying half, it's more. Okay. 75%, I heard Kristen Welker earlier today on MSNBC saying that their recent poll shows 54% of the people we polled say that they don't, you know, they, they, they think abortion should be legal. It's more like 75%, okay? I don't know where they got their snap poll. But regardless, 54% still more than 50 more more people say that abortion should be legal in the United States. Of course, Alito did stipulate 
We don't listen to mud people. The Nazis didn't listen to mud people. Why should we? Well, he didn't put it that way. What he said is that he he believes the court should not be subject to public opinion. So when the court of public opinion says, you know, slavery is wrong, Alito says, listen to me, you little people. You don't know diddly. I have studied the situation, and yes, the only way that our economy can work is if we enslave people. You're going to stop that? <sighs> Why? What, you know, we never get a George Clooney-looking type jurist that uh, issues these proclamations. It's always the most, I don't know, I, I, I just got to say, they're not coming from the master race that they keep saying that we need to have. Just saying. Alito? Yeah, you look at that guy and you go, boy, that guy's sexually repressed. Look at him. I know that's not nice. It's not intellectual. But I don't care anymore. Alito is a pursed lip, little sexually repressed prick. And I got to tell you, they're not going to stop at Roe v. Wade. They're not going to stop at Griswold. Yeah, they're going to take birth control away too, okay? There won't be any forced vasectomies. No siree. And uh, uh, penal enhancement drugs will uh, uh, be subsidized by the government. Got to have them. You can't have marital rape unless you got a guy who's sex crazed. Well, you don't need to be sex crazed. It isn't about the sex. It's about the power anyway, isn't it? So, yeah, they're going to take birth control away. And a lot of people saying they're going to go after same-sex marriage. They're going to go after loving v. Virginia. He, Alito cited that in his draft opinion as being one of the pillars of uh, uh, bad law. That Roe v. Wade was predicated on. <laughs> Which makes you wonder what's going to happen with Ginny and Clarence. Well, I tell everybody, you know, if you deal with the Nazis, you're going to, if you, if you're a Vichy to the Nazis, you're going to end up at the rock pile too, eventually. And I suspect Ginny will stand off to the side and go, I'm sorry, Clarence, but thanks for the ride. Maybe. It does bug me that we know more about Depp and Heard, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, than we know about Jenny and Clarence. And I'm going to be pissed if we find out that there are some liberal jurists who are recusing themselves from this decision because they had worked on prior cases involving Roe v. Wade or anything to do with abortion. Or women's health, I should put it. I'm going to be really pissed. Because each of those five jurists should have been recusing themselves specifically from this particular case. But they don't have to follow ethics rules. They are the ethical ones because look at them, they're in the robes. Why don't they put on a powdered wig? There's more historical precedent for that, isn't there, Sam. All right, what's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy as we begin this uh, uh, perilous Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. At the top, yeah, Alito's leaked draft opinion is as full-throated and muscular a decision as could ever be imagined, ever. On the rest of the menu, lawmakers in 18 states are following California's lead in offering legal refuge to displaced transgender youth and their families. And I would think that uh, these Democratic-run states will be offering, offering sanctuary for women needing abortion, too. But wait for it. I can't remember. Was it Oklahoma or was it? I can't remember the state that made it a law that you can't cross state lines to get an abortion. So what are they going to do? Set up a checkpoint? Are you pregnant, ma'am? Where are you going? 
On the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe, DeSantis has vowed to eliminate gun permits and background checks in Florida. You know, there's another court case coming up here that SCOTUS is going to decide upon. Which makes me think, I guess the shorter SCOTUS ruling is that if a botched abortion doesn't get rid of all these witches, maybe giving a gun to their abusive husbands will. And a bronze statue depicting one of Oklahoma's most famous Native American ballerinas was cut from its base outside a Tulsa museum and sold for scrap. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where the first elected female leader of Panama's Wunan indigenous group has officially taken office. And Poland urged the EU to slap sanctions on Russian oil and gas. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left, across the page from that chat room link, near the bottom of our homepage at netroosradio.com, is the link to our Patreon page. And please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio and send us money. You could you could maybe send us what you would spend, even in these inflationary times. Uh, what you might spend on an espresso type coffee drink, for instance. And if you could send those funds to us once a month, it really helps. So please do that at patreon.com. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thanks, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary at Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And then get that posted up on social media like Twitter and those other ones, too. I really try. So uh, the show notes and links, of course, is where the real reportage can be found. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West while we still can. And pick up podcasts by way of, oh, did I say at Cookbook West? Yes. Follow the show there on Twitter. Well, we still can. And pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. And, of course, do pick up, or you can find, and you can also pick up, pick them up, uh, the podcast of the Netroots Radio Deep Archive. The Netroots Radio Library can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. Okay. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, is by Holly Raymer out of the Associated Press. Democratic lawmakers in more than a dozen states are following California's lead in seeking to offer legal refuge to displaced transge- transgender youth and their families. The coordinated effort announced being announced today, Tuesday, by the LGBTQ Victory Institute and other advocates comes in response to recent actions taken in conservative states. In Texas, for example, Abbott has directed state agencies to consider placing transgender children in foster care, though a judge has temporarily blocked such investigations. They're going to investigate you to see if your kid might be transgender, and then they're going to take the kid away from you and maybe throw you in jail. Okay. All it takes is, like, the Stasi quota kick into place and have a neighbor say, hey, I think they're trying to harbor a transgender kid in that house. Because they don't like you, maybe they want to take your property when you go. And multiple states have approved measures prohibiting gender-affirming health care treatments for transgender youth. To combat such moves, 
Lawmakers in both Minnesota and New York recently fa- filed refuge state legislation modeled after the bill proposed in March by State Senator Scott Weiner or Weiner in California. Democrats in 16 other states plan to follow suit, though about half of their legislators are out of session or not currently accepting new bills. Weiner said he immediately began hearing from other states after coming forward with his bill, which would reject any out-of-state court judgments, removing children from their parents' custody because they allowed gender-affirming health care. It also would make arrest warrants based on alleged violations of another state's law against receiving such care, the lowest priority for California law enforcement, but we know what that means. California law enforcement doesn't care. (laughs) Okay, I'm just... All right. Also joining the effort are LGBTQ lawmakers in Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Kansas, Kentucky, Maine, Michigan, New Hampshire, New Mexico, Oregon, Rhode Island, Vermont, Washington State, and West Virginia. Cole of the American Independent brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Charter Tuesdays. Florida Republican Governor Ron DeSantis vowed that the state would one day have a permitless weapons carry law. I'm pretty sure we can get it signed into law, he said during a news conference in the town of Williston near Gainesville. According to the Florida Phoenix, DeSantis said, The legislator will get it done. I can't tell you if it's going to be next week, six months, but I can tell you that before I am done as governor and maybe on my way to the presidency, (laughs) we will have a signature on that bill. Now, permitless carry laws allow individuals to carry loaded, concealed handguns without a permit, background check, or firearms training. In other words, if you have an abusive husband or boyfriend, (laughs) good luck to you. Now, under current Florida law, gun owners must be licensed, and the process of obtaining a permit includes required written proof of competency with a firearm. And not just, you know, winging your uh, your ex because you're pissed. That's not competency, okay? In a report published in September of 2021, the Center for American Progress noted that in Wisconsin, which in 2011 uh, enacted a law allowing the concealed carrying of weapons after permit to do so, uh, has uh, an analysis of publicly available data from local agencies, the FBI and other national database suggests that the law led to negative consequences for safety in the state. Who could have foreseen that? Who? Three categories of violent gun-related crime have increased since its implementation. Gun homicides, aggravated assaults that involve a gun, and gun-related homicides and assaults against law enforcement. The report concludes that the overwhelming evidence of a was- out of Wisconsin is an important case study for why these laws are detrimental to public safety and why continued action on gun violence prevention remains critical. DeSantis, who is running for re-election, and you know he's trying to be president too, is pursuing a far-right political agenda that includes a host of bills affecting civil rights, including voter suppression and LGBTQ plus issues. In an op-ed published in the South Florida Sentinel in March, historian Ruth ben Giat referred to the state as a, quote, laboratory for autocracy, end quote, echoing the title of author and politician David Pepper's book, Laboratories of Autocracy, in which he argues 
that anti-democratic measures that threaten the U.S. system of government originate more and more in the state houses, not in the halls of Congress. Associated Press staff bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A bronze statue depicting one of Oklahoma's most famous Native American ballerinas was cut from its base outside a Tulsa museum and sold for scrap to a recycling company, authorities said yesterday, Monday. Museum officials say the Five Moon statue of Marjorie Tallchief was likely removed last Thursday from its plinth outside the Tulsa Historical Society. Museum officials received a call on Monday from CMC Recycling in Southwest Rogers County to identify what was believed to be pieces of the bronze statue. Michelle Place, director of the Tulsa Historical Society and Museum, checked out the recovered pieces late yesterday morning and verified they came from the statue. The Tulsa Police Department is working diligently to apprehend the thief, the Historical Society said. Pieces of the statue, including the head and part of an arm, are still missing. Place said the original mold for the statue burned in a foundry fire, so recreating the statue will be much more difficult and complicated. I am devastated by this, she said. The statues, known as the Five Moons, were created by Tulsa area artists Monty England and Gary Henson. England worked on two of the pieces before his death in 2005, and Henson completed the project. The other Five Moon statues of renowned American Indian ballerinas depict Yvonne Chateau, Rosella Hightower, Mosselin Larkin, and Maria Tallchief, Marjorie Tallchief's sister. All right, well, let's hope they catch these perps. Now let's get to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish off with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. And welcome to COVID Quickly, a Scientific American podcast series. This is your fast track update on the COVID pandemic. We bring you up to speed on the science behind the most urgent questions about the virus and the disease. We demystify the research and help you understand what it really means. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. And we're Scientific American's senior health editors. Today, we're going to talk about reducing infections by improving indoor air quality. And how a lot of people approve of masks on planes and other precautions, despite what you see on the news. You and I talk a lot about how COVID spreads through the air and the importance of masks. But when it comes to stopping airborne infections, there's a longer-term solution that doesn't require a filter across your face, isn't there? Absolutely. It's time we started improving the quality of the air inside our buildings. We spend 90% of our time indoors, but we devote very little effort to making that air healthy for human beings. As Lindsay Marr, an aerosol expert at Virginia Tech, put it, we don't rely on people to filter their water individually. We provide clean, safe drinking water. Good point. 
Why don't we care as much about indoor air? It's not like we just realize that breathing is important for health. It's more of a recent building design issue. In the last 40 years or so, we started sealing things up more in the name of energy efficiency. But though tighter seals reduce AC or heating bills, they also make it easier for the virus that causes COVID and other germs to accumulate in the air, making us sick. So in solving one problem, we created another. Shouldn't there be standards for indoor air quality? Well, there are, kind of. A professional engineering society called ASHRAE sets standards for all our buildings, including offices, schools, and restaurants. But these rules are mostly meant to protect equipment, not people. Okay, I'm less important than a refrigerator. It really sounds like it's time for an update. Yes, it is. In fact, the Biden administration recently launched a push to improve the quality of air inside buildings. It has three pillars, ventilation, filtration, and air disinfection. Ventilation is basically how much fresh air you can bring in. The more fresh air, the more it dilutes any virus hanging around. Good. And then pillar two is filtration. That's using high-quality air filters to remove virus particles. The filters have names like HEPA and MERV, and the E in both stands for efficiency. Right. And finally, there's air disinfection. For example, using UV light to kill or inactivate a virus in the air. The Biden administration put out a practical guide for building managers and anyone who owns a home or business and wants to upgrade the air quality. We'll put a link in the transcript. This all sounds good on paper, Tanya, but it also sounds expensive. If I owned a small business or ran a school, I'd worry that I couldn't afford to do all these things. Would I have to foot the bill myself? That's a great question. The American Rescue Plan actually contains $122 billion for schools and $350 billion for state, local, and tribal governments to support some of these improvements. But Congress doesn't want to keep funding the pandemic response indefinitely. So it seems unlikely there will be a lot more federal money allocated for this. Fortunately, some businesses that have the resources are taking it upon themselves to upgrade the air quality. Okay, that gets us part of the way there. There's an argument, too, that this is not just good health. It's good business as well, right? Yeah. The benefits of fresh air go beyond COVID and even other respiratory diseases. Joseph Allen, director of the Healthy Buildings Program at Harvard School of Public Health, says it's just good business sense. Studies have shown that poorly ventilated places actually affect cognition and mental performance. We all know how awful it feels to sit in a stuffy conference room. Exactly. And we all deserve to breathe clean, healthy air. Last week, a judge in Florida struck down the mask mandate for airplanes and public transportation. News and social media were filled with photos of people gleefully discarding their masks. I also saw news videos of people cheering on planes. But like many news stories during the pandemic, those videos give the wrong impression. They actually represent the minority of Americans, not the majority. Yeah, it turns out that most people want masks on planes, trains, and public transit. That's according to a poll by the National Opinion Research Center and the AP. 59% of people, in fact. The poll sampled about 1,000 Americans of various ideologies and backgrounds. They got the question right before the judge ruled against the mandate and before the Biden administration said that it would appeal the ruling. More than half, huh? The loudest people get the most attention, I guess. But the majority of people in this country actually do support taking some public health precautions. You hear about the people who don't trust vaccines, but if you look at the numbers, 66% of Americans have gotten fully vaccinated. That's 219 million. And the number of doses given out per day doubled this month compared to March to almost 500,000. Big name athletes get headlines for refusing shots, but in the NBA, more than 90% of players get them. In the airline industry, United said that 99.5% of employees did so. Videos capture the shouting, but the data show the caring, and that's something to keep in mind. Now you're up to speed. Thanks for joining us. Our show is edited by Jeff Del Vizio and Tuliga Bose. Come back in two weeks for the next episode of COVID Quickly and check out Siam.com for updated and in-depth COVID news. This is a message from CDC. After hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods, standing water and excess moisture help mold grow in your home, garage, and other structures. When you return to a home that has been flooded, know that you're likely to have mold. 
Mold puts your family's health at risk. If you have mold growing in your home, you should clean it up and fix other water problems, such as leaks in roofs, walls, or plumbing. Keep your children and pets out of affected areas until you've cleaned. Control moisture in your home to prevent mold growth. To remove mold growth from hard surfaces, use commercial products, soap and water, or a bleach solution of no more than one cup of household laundry bleach in one gallon of water. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. Never mix bleach with ammonia or other household cleaners. It will produce dangerous, toxic fumes. Open windows and doors to provide fresh air. For more information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? It's all we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. Netrootsradio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Welcome to 60 Second Civics. We're joined once again today by Dr. Scott Casper, president of the American Antiquarian Society. Dr. Casper, what questions did the framers address in organizing the legislative branch? The delegates were certainly concerned about legislatures going unchecked. That's the legislative tyranny concern, or rushing to judgment. They also raised the question of precisely how to grant powers to the national legislature, to the Congress. Should those powers, for example, be only enumerated powers, powers that were listed and beyond which the legislature could not go? They had learned from the Articles of Confederation that the problem with enumerated powers was that it left the legislature with very little possibility of enforcing the laws it passed. So they wanted to create some balance between enumerating specific responsibilities and powers of Congress and providing Congress with some kind of broader grant of power that allowed it to enforce or to legislate the enforcement of the powers that were listed. And that's how we get the, the necessary and proper clause of the Constitution. That is, Congress has the power to pass acts that are necessary and proper for exercising the foregoing powers. You can find more interviews with Dr. Scott Casper in the We the People Open Course, a free online course on the U.S. Constitution at learn.civiced.org. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. The problem with our so-called free market is that it's not free for you and me. It's largely controlled by monopolies, which are free to inflate prices just because they can, letting gougers gleefully extract unwarranted monopoly profits from us. This milking of consumers by tightly consolidated industries is propelling today's surging price hikes. Brand-name corporations claim they're being forced to mark up price tags just to cover rising costs for raw materials, labor, transportation, etc. But in a competitive marketplace, they'd have to eat much of those increases by taking a bit less in profits. Indeed, monopolies are now raising prices simply to squeeze even greater profits from hard-hit consumers, a game of corporate greed that socks America with more inflation. Consider diapers. A year ago, Procter & Gamble announced that the pandemic was driving up its production costs, forcing it to raise prices for its Pampers brand. At the time, it had just posted a quarterly profit of $3.8 billion, so P&G could easily have absorbed a temporary rise in its costs. But instead of holding the price to ease their customers' economic pain, the conglomerate used a global health crisis to justify upping diaper prices. Six months later, P&G's quarterly profit topped $5 billion. And in that same quarter, 
P&G spent $3 billion to buy back shares of its own stock, a Wall Street manipulation that artificially bloats the wealth of top executives and other big shareholders. In short, P&G used the excuse of inflation to inflate the price of their diapers, then used the extra money it extracted to inflate the value of its stock to benefit rich shareholders. This is Jim Hightower saying, well, couldn't consumers just switch to Huggies, the brand sold by P&G's main competitor? No, for it's a co-monopolist, having also goosed up its prices. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1886. A little after 3 o'clock on that Monday in Chicago, radical labor activist and newspaper man August Spees climbed onto a boxcar to give a speech about the fight for the eight-hour day. For weeks, he had been giving speeches all over the city in the ramp-up for the large May Day strike and rallies. Despite being exhausted, he agreed to address the crowd of German and Bohemian lumber shovers. Very near the rally where Spee spoke stood the McCormick Reaper Works. The McCormick workers had been at the heart of labor struggles in the city. 1,500 workers had been locked out of the McCormick plant over a dispute about wages. Tensions ran high as the company brought in scab labor to replace the locked out workers. Approximately 200 striking McCormick workers picketed outside the plant. As Spees gave his speech to the lumber shovers, the shift bell at McCormick sounded, marking the end of the workday. As the scabs exited the building, the angry locked out workers swarmed around them. Suddenly, shots rang out from the direction of the McCormick plant. Spees climbed off his boxcar and ran to the plant to see what happened. There, he found 200 police officers shooting at the strikers and beating them with clubs. In all, the police killed four strikers and wounded many more. Outraged, August Spees ran back to his newspaper office, where he drafted a circular that urged working men to retaliate for the police violence. He began to plan for a rally for the next day at Haymarket Square, in what would become one of the most significant events in the global labor movement and history. Labor History in Two, brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at west coast cookbook and speakeasy terry town chowder tuesdays we always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the rogue river and the rogue river valley of southern oregon on the west coast of the continental united states of america where it is currently 48 degrees fahrenheit expecting a high much warmer than yesterday Expecting a high in the mid to upper 60s, uh, sun and clouds mixed, and winds will be light and variable. Partly cloudy skies overnight with lows in the mid 40s, winds remaining light and variable, then mostly sunny skies tomorrow, oh my, with highs near 80. And winds will be out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour, but it looks like we might have some rain coming in on Wednesday night and bringing quite a bit of precipitation for the rest of the week and oh my god a snowy mix on the weekend let's hope that's at elevation and not where my garden is we can only hope okay confirmed cases of Coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon, as I stated uh, previously on another, well, probably yesterday, uh, have not been updated from its Friday totals. But as a reminder, we do stand at 430,033 confirmed cases and our deceased had gone up on Friday. Uh, this is the last time that we had the case numbers uh, confirmed deceased. 
stands at 531, which was an increase of four from the previous report. Grass pollen is rated high outside the window here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the Rogue River Valley region is good at 35 parts per million, which just means people are going to burn their trash. They do that here. It's so disgusting. And the the daytime UV index is high at level 7. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.28 inches. Visibility is at 9 miles. And relative humidity is at 97%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 58 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 68 and sunny. Rome is 70 degrees and fair with a chance of thunder showers and uh, flash flooding. So take care there. Kiev is 67 and fair. Kabul is 57 and cloudy. Hong Kong is 72 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 60 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 62 degrees and clear. San Francisco, California is 58 and sunny. And New York, New York is 60 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Staff at the Associated Press bring us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The first elected female leader of Panama's Wunan Indigenous Group took office yesterday, Monday. The inauguration of Olina Ismari Opua marks a strengthening of women's positions in the country's indigenous communities. Recently, Elena Cruz Guerrera won the leadership of the indigenous territory of Nagabe Bulgula, and a woman from the Guna community was elected to the National Congress in 2019. I apologize for the terrible pronunciations of these words. Asensio Palacio, the country's assistant minister for indigenous affairs, said women's roles in leading indigenous communities is growing stronger. There is an increasing trend of alternating power between men and women in the indigenous territory, said Palacio. Women have been demanding their space and daring to compete in traditional elections. The Wunan are one of the smaller communities that make up Panama's total 450,000 indigenous population in a country of about 4.3 million people. Je te donne mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Lauren Cook of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Poland urged its EU partners yesterday, Monday, to unite and impose sweeping sanctions on Russia's oil and natural gas sectors over the war in Ukraine and not to cave into pressure to pay for their gas in Russian rubles. The appeal came as EU ministers met in Brussels to discuss their response to Russia's decision last week to cut gas supplies to Bulgaria and Poland 
energy giant Gazprom says the two countries failed to pay their bills in April. Well, good. And that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up tomorrow for... That's right, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And boy, is it breaking. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver